the lifeblood of a democracy is your ability to understand and act upon a problem once the facts are presented to you. The purpose of this motion picture is to give you the facts, and then you, as individuals and citizens of a democracy, must take action. Often when I speak, the press want to talk about the tragedy of the day. They want to talk about terrorism. They want to talk about weapons of mass destruction. They want to talk about emerging infections. I was at a press conference a couple of years ago, and no matter what the press conference was about, the second question would always be something about a terrorist, something about a bomb, something about chemical warfare. So one reporter one day made a mistake in a room filled like this and said to me, Surgeon General, what's the most pressing issue before you today? And I said, obesity. Room was silent. None of them knew what to ask. And I said to them, they said, why do you say that? I said, because obesity is the terror within. It is destroying us, destroying our society from within. And unless we do something about it, the magnitude of the dilemma will dwarf 9-11 or any other terrorist event that you can point out to me. So this is a terror from within. It's destroying us. Hi, my name is Brooke. And I'm 12 years old, and I'm going, I'm going to have liposuction. Why? Because I've struggled many years with my weight problems. I've been on so many diets, and nothing helps. Okay, Look that. stand back up. You know, usually when girls go on a scale, they take off their earrings, take off their socks, and take off their lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> 218, huh? Well, it is unusual to do surgery on somebody that's 12 years old it or is, something like this, but, but you know what's what? the choice? That's it. What's the choice? Well, yeah, yeah. We don't really By have it. By the time a... we wait till she's 18 years old, she's liable to be 300 pounds. Well, and I'm worried about the emotional yeah. scars. Okay, well, tell us what you've got. Well, this right here is the big apron that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. And actually, under here, I've had um, this, it gets infected right here, and then it smells really bad from the infection and then it burns too so and, and you know if you've got a daughter that does have a weight problem you know you want to try to do the best that you could do for them you don't like to see your kid be ridiculed or or, or shunned or, or made fun of so we're going to take some of this fat out here a bunch of it mm. all here and here and here get rid of some of these rolls it's just going to be so great to go to school and just have everyone like you without being a part of just one group like you can just be because everyone like knew me as just like the nice girl like no one knew me as anything else but I want to go back and be something else well we're ready um, no I think we can go back and get started mom you can just you, you want to just wait outside yeah or? I'd love to give me huh? a kiss I love you so much yeah. This cannula is blunt. The tip is blunt and the holes are blunt. So when it goes through the tissue, we push aside the arteries, nerves, and veins just as my fingers are pushed aside and not hurt in any way. Yellow fat. For years, the government's warned there's an epidemic of obesity in America. Some might say that being fat in this country is becoming part of American life. Two-thirds of the country is overweight or obese. That's 60 million people. It's shocking it's, and shameful that as a country we've let the problem get that bad. As a nation, we're 5 billion pounds overweight. And it's killing us. Obesity is deadly because it leads to many diseases clogged arteries and heart disease, cancer and gallbladder disease. High blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. The effects of diabetes are just about everywhere. Uh, I feel very strongly about this. Obesity is a crime on the body. It can do all kinds of horrid things. It's a fact of life. I lost it. And diabetes had something to do with it. All the adolescents today that have diabetes are going to be losing their toes and their fingers in the 30s and 10, 20 years later they're going to be unable to move. 
That means in the next decade, 10 years, we're going to have 40 or 45 percent of school-age children insulin dependent. What are we thinking? This generation of children is the heaviest in American history. More than 9 million U.S. children are seriously overweight and obese. The obesity rate has more than tripled for children between the ages of 6 to 11 in the last three decades. And in fact, we may be producing a generation of children whose life expectancy isn't as long as our own. And shame on us. But the bottom line is that uh, we got too many kids, too overweight, and they're walking time bombs. Your parents were fat, you're fat. Like, cause my parents were both fat. My mom had a gastric bypass surgery, and then my dad, like, he just got, because he died four years ago. He was fat, too. This is the obesity crisis. And the fact is that human beings are at the cusp of an evolutionary uh, disaster. four million years and doing oh, doing almost all that time they've they've not had enough food and so the evolutionary advantage is always conferred upon those people who are good at food acquisition and food consumption and in developing ways of storing food and that's advantageous in a world where there's an insufficient supply of food there's an unbelievable shift in the dynamics of the relationship between food and the effort to get it Remember, we're hunters, gatherers, and catching any animals not easy. You have to run for dinner. Hunter gatherers are very busy folks, and they spend just about all of their daylight hours in activities that are directly related to getting that day's food. And the thing is, most of foods in the natural environment are not calorically dense. They are they are very low in calories per unit mass. And so when a hunter-gatherer encounters a, a, a rich package of, of nutrients, they are um, programmed to eat as much of it as they can because it's so rare. Natural selection couldn't possibly have ever envisioned a situation in which a human being would need to cut down on their fat intake. There was never so much fat out there that we needed to evolve any mechanism to say, hey, you've had enough fat for today, cut it out. Human beings have no real way of turning off their uh, food desire. There's two things that have allowed humans to thrive over the, over the course of our, of, of our whole evolution. The fact that we want to have sex all the time and we want to eat all the time. To, to think that we can just say, I'm not going to listen to this signal is overly simplistic. It would be very much like uh, a group of church people saying, no, you shouldn't do sex. Well, people will do sex, and they will eat. Basically, you know, we're just, we're just um, rather clever, intelligent apes in terms of our basic biology. Those of us who are interested in obesity have to, I think, understand that the victim, the average person that eats too much, is really struggling with something of historic proportions. It's not that they, they, they have no self-discipline, it's that we're in the wrong place at the wrong time as a species. As a species, humans adapt to their environments. And a lot of what happens is below the level of our conscious awareness. And so oftentimes, the things that we do, we do automatically, we don't even realize it. If you ask the typical person how many food-related decisions they make in a day, the average person is going to say about 15. WANSYNC estimates we make 200-plus food choices every day. Most of them are influenced by factors we don't even notice, like the size of the serving dish or the distance back to the kitchen for a refill. I mean, even just before breakfast, you're deciding what cereal you want, how much you're going to pour, whether to put sugar on it, how much milk to put on it, whether you're going to have a refill, whether to cut fruit. And there's 12 decisions that are made, bam, before you even sit down and have your first bite for the day. People tend to eat uh, based on the size of the package or the amount that's on their plate. That's, you know, that's the guide to how much to consume. And obviously, people are eating too much. This is the way we eat. This is what we've been looking for for 
hundreds of years, thousands of years. In 75 years, we've gone from having very little to eat and really being concerned about that to being able to go out and for a few bucks in our pocket, eat more than our fill. This must be an appropriate amount of french fries to eat or I wouldn't have been given this many french fries. This is, I think this is the right size of, of a meal or they wouldn't offer these things like this. You know what I love about this? Free refills. Mm. Some of you guys know better may not realize that there's <clears throat> probably about 360 calories in this right here. I eat at the fast food places occasionally. I'll order a kid's meal when I go through the drive-thru. And I, I get giggled at because I get the little toy and I bring it home to my children. But that is an adult appropriate size. It's not a kid appropriate size. And the meals that they're selling to adults are a family appropriate size. Some years ago I began using the term toxic environment to describe the food and physical activity environment that people are exposed to. And toxic is a pretty strong word. But if you think about toxic, it means that something is introduced into the environment that makes people sick. Environmental conditions change, people get sick from it. So you think about a poison, for example. But the food environment has changed in, in ways that I think are toxic because large portions, heavy promotion, relentless and heavy promotion of unhealthy foods by the food industry and any other number of factors combine to create a pretty much the perfect storm, if you will, that almost guarantees obesity under modern conditions. Everywhere you go, there's food available. When I was young, if you went to the gas station, you could only get gas. Now you can get candy and chips and everything. When you went to a bookstore, you could just get a book. Now you can get coffee and pastries and chocolates. I mean, every place, hardware stores, you know, car washes, everybody has got food and vending machines and so there are cues all around us all the time that are making us think it's time to eat. Freebie, it's back at Les Schwab. Choose from the West largest selection of tires. Company wide, we're giving our customers over one million dollars worth of free beef with the tires they buy. Free beef. When we talk about what caused the obesity epidemic, uh, there are many factors. Part of what I find fascinating is how people want to just grossly oversimplify this. All we have to do is have people eat less and exercise more. Not a very big problem. And have their pet little theories about what it is or, you know, a really simple equation. The rise of obesity can be parallel with the rise of the Golden Arches and all the other fast food companies. There are a lot of complex factors involved here genetics, social factors, a whole variety of factors that have to do with diet, exercise, and so forth. And then part of it has to do with stress patterns. We know from the scientific evidence that the stress piece of the puzzle is as important as the diet piece, and that's as important as the exercise piece. But all we hear about from the public health officials is eat less, exercise more, and that is clearly not working. One reaction to stress is cravings for food. That's a very common response that's well documented in all sorts of different ways. When you're under stress, your body really dials itself back. Your metabolism goes down and you get into a storage state where you're actually, your body is thinking that you're, you're under famine conditions and so you don't burn the fat. There's a very interesting connection between cortisol, which is made by our adrenal glands, uh, and obesity. The more stressed you are, the fatter you get. So cortisol is telling our brain to eat, and it's telling our belly to store. And that makes perfect sense if you're expending energy in response to stress. But if our stress is from traffic jams, and bills, and deadlines, and family issues, we're not expending any calories, but we're getting the very same eat-store signals from cortisol, and that's leading us to be, become fat. We are working harder, we are more stressed, we do have less time for sleep. On a grand scale, this whole war on terror is, is the perfect recipe for making a population obese. Murders, regimes dedicating to killing us, tyranny and terror, slaughtered thousands. I think there's very little doubt that the culture of fear is involved in the obesity epidemic. I think the evidence is pretty clear about that. Weapons program. The deadliest of weapons. Terrible weapons. Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. Introduce something into the population that makes every single person scared 
or concerned or stressed at a very low grade level. It's not something where you're hiding under your bed or you're, or you're closing the blinds every day. It's always in the back of your mind. The evil terrorist, poison gas, torture chambers, mass graves, deadly technologies. And it really is leading us to become a society of, of overstressed, overweight, under-exercised people. And it, and it really is a combination of those. It's, it's not as simple as eating a healthy diet anymore.